What's up, everyone? Welcome to Hit and Sit, the Conference U-Triple-S-A podcast, episode number four. We've made it through. We've made it through three. Let's see if we can make it through four. I'm David Seitman-Garland, your host from Seitman Pure and host also of the Seitman Softball Podcast, and joined by our extremely esteemed panel and our special guest. We'll start with our quickly our esteemed panel. We've got Mr. Jason Magnum joining us for his fourth show from Monsta. How are you, Jason? Awesome. Awesome. Good to see you. Uh, Mr. Joel Sanchez from SNE, the shortstop, back for his fourth show as well. How are you, Joel? Excellent. How are you? I'm excellent. And, of course, the glue, the professor of media at USSA, at Conference USSA, we've got Mr. Dale Weiser, DW. How are you, Dale? Doing good, David. Good to see you. And, by the way, our number one comment we've seen on, on YouTube is people want more DW on the show. So we're going to see if we uh -huh. can give them so much that they can't handle it. Um, and then we've got our very special guest here today, Mr. Jason Oberlag, a.k.a. J. Red from yeah. Arkansas, our guest this week. How are you, Jason? Good to see you. Hey, it's good to see you guys. I'm doing well. Great to be here. Thanks. Appreciate it. We're bringing in the, you know, the umpire perspective here. So, you know, today I was, I was, our topics are two interesting ones, umps and balls. To uh, you know, so two of softball's favorite and least favorite things. I'll let you guys all figure that out. But anyway, let's hop right into it. Let's start with umpiring. I'm going to start with this question, and, and let's go with everyone here. Um, and I'm going to start with Jason on this. Jason Magnum on this question. We have all J's. Um, have you ever been ejected from a game? Any sport could be anything at any time. What was the story? And was it the right call? So I don't know why I'm going with Jason Magnum first. That just popped in my head. I don't know why, J Mag. No insult uh, intended. Let's let's go right at you. Yeah, I've been ejected uh, in basketball before, not softball. Uh, it got a little rough, and some hands got thrown, and and there were some ejections. Uh, I think I was 16 years old, 15 years old. Uh, the basketball is real big where I'm from, and it gets real intense, and it's just something that happened, but. I got pushed in the back, fouled, and I kind of didn't like it, and a little bit happened. Yeah, but no one Jackson's in softball whatsoever. Oh, that's good. And, and did was it the right call, by the way, in basketball to boot you out of there? Um, I felt like I was gonna get ejected. I, I, it was the right call, wrong call by me. I should have did a little bit more and earned my ejection. <laughs> you know, I should have got my money's worth. Okay, so you only got you yeah. only got fifty cents on a on a dollar ejection. I got gotcha. you. All yeah, right. he gave me a push, and I gave him a push back, and I felt like that wasn't that wasn't I didn't earn it. That's funny. That's funny, Joel. What about you? <clears throat> so you triggered my whole hot spot. <laughs> I didn't even uh, like. Yeah, here we go. I, I thought I was gonna need a little coffee this morning. I thought I woke up a little late. I was like, oh, my Prada bags are showing. My first year, my first full year in the conference, we're playing pure at the duels. And Pure has this insanely stacked squad where it's like Vitzak pitching, Brungard at third, McClanahan in the middle, um, some giant colossal dude. I forgot. He was like 6'6", just full of tattoos. Like, it was just an insane lineup. And that year was a rough beginning, like right out of the gate. I remember our first duel being 0-2, and, and we lost at like 3 a.m., the very next day, it was like the same thing. We are down five. We're down like eight runs. I come up to bat, and I hit. Uh, this is when I was strictly pull, where like my backside was shortstop, you know. So it was just like, Vince like throws me something outside. I'm here like, hey, let's try this backside stuff. And I go to take a hack at it, and I hit it right back at him. It, I didn't have enough time to see what was going on. I hit it. I saw it went right back at him, and I started running the first base. The first baseman jumps. It was a terrible throw, and I'm at first. McClanahan and Vitzek called time, and they hit me with a... It hit my foot, and it jumped right up in the air, and I caught it. That should be out umpires get together and I'm here like there's no way they're taking that serious and they both look at me I'm reading their lips I'm reading it because they're right there like five feet away from me and they're like did you see something I, like, I didn't see anything we'd be like do you think it hit his foot he goes 
I don't think he hit his foot. Okay. Batter is out. And I go, oh, oh, no, Frodo. <laughs> and I just start, I, like, we just got there to the conference. The only major dude I had was Bloomer. And Bloomer, with a major experience, jumps in and starts hassling everybody put together. And I'm here like, my man, somebody's got my back. All of us, we're still like, what just happened? Jason Branch looks at me and he goes, damn, Sanchez, I thought you had more in you. I thought I would have burned this whole place down by now. And I was just like, yo. So all game long, I do these little subtle, subtle, subtle. about – Anybody else in the feet stuff? There's nothing subtle about you. You know? <laughs> oh, you either. So what happens <laughs> is everybody starts looking around and be like, what? And then I start making like, oh, toe jam. Very little. Is it? We are down by 30 at this point. We're getting creamed. And I just keep making my little feet jokes. By the fifth inning, that happened in the second inning, he goes, all right, shortstop, you're out of here. I just, I just walked right off the field. Was, just was it right justified? Away. You think justified? Was he justified? No, yeah. Were, were you? Was he justified in booting you out? That just means he was paying attention to me more than the game. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. So kick That means he's inserting seat. himself into the game and be like, mm-hmm. what's sure. he saying? Because everybody else, you're going to tell me that little poor nobody A shortstop over here that just got thrown out and is down by 45, you're really going to be that petty and pay attention to him? When everybody else, uh, quote unquote, the usual suspects are in the grill and everybody's just like, I'm not going to throw him out. You going to throw him out? I, th- I like that we opened just a completely can of worms here with Joel. No surprise there, but I like the story. No, no, no. It's chaos. No. <laughs> you gonna get it I, I like it I like it now DW your sports background yeah. did you have you gotten the boot from anything at any time all right so I managed like four or five teams for like 20 years I played and managed on those teams and it was a CD level league called the Brooklyn Premier League in Cleveland Ohio uh now Jay Jay Red you you listen to this and tell me if I was right or wrong our shortstop fields the ball, routine play, throws to second. Our second baseman looks like he's going to catch it for the force play. The runner going to second thinks he's going to be out. He doesn't slide. He doesn't stop. But he crosses the base and just kind of gives himself up, goes actually into the outfield grass about 15 feet behind second base. Second baseman drops the ball. Now the runner sees that he drops the ball, starts running towards third. Second baseman picks up the ball, throws it to third. Our third baseman catches it just as the runner runs into him. And the, the field ump calls uh, runner interference. I, I thought he was out of the baseline. I made a big stink. I might have, may or may not have kicked some dirt. I don't know. And I get tossed. I wish so we had video we'll, footage of this, by the way. I, I really wish we had video footage of nah, this. Nah, back then, there's no video back then. But, Jason, what, what do you think? So... Well, so ba- baseline is only established uh, when there's a play being made on you. So I, I could hit the ball. I could run all the way to the dugout but not go in the dugout and then run to first if I wanted to. So there's no baseline there unless someone's attempting to make a play on me. And so, hmm. I, you know, that, that, that's good. But if he didn't give himself up and he rounded second and he went to the outfield and then well, he, didn't run, he went through second straight to center field. And stop. Yeah. Well, if, if, if nobody has the ball trying to make a play on him, yeah. then there is no baseline. So he could run the third. Stab- you get three foot either way once somebody tries to put a tag on you. Okay. So I was probably in the wrong, so it was probably right that the guy tossed me. <laughs> maybe I'm maybe I'm one day we'll find old, old black and white footage on some old camera, like a nine millimeter, and we'll see this yeah. play. But you never that know. That was 1999. <laughs> no video. I'm going to need to see DW kick some dirt. I want to go I back to the argue boys. Give us your Sorry. argue voice, DW. On, 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 that, on that incident there. And you're right. Sometimes uh, the human element does get involved sometimes on, on throwing people out and, and whatever. And every umpire is completely different. We can huddle about it before a tournament and say, here's the things that we're going to throw people out for. But until you're in that situation, it's a little different. And, and I would have assumed – not knowing the play, haven't seen it, whatever, just what you were telling me, if he let you go that long and say those things, 
I think probably they, they realized that they didn't get it right, so they gave you a little bit of a leash, um, uh, and and then they then they had to dump you. But if you're not saying it loud enough for anyone else to hear, here's my deal. Two two things about me throwing people out. If you put a pronoun in front of it, so there's a difference between that's a horrible effing call versus you're a horrible effing umpire. Two completely different things there. So and if I know if I kick the call. I'm probably going to let you have your say a little bit as long as it's between you and me and you drop it. We're good. Um, but if it becomes personal and you put a pronoun in front of it and it's loud enough that someone next to me or you can hear, th then you're going to have to go. We get into this whole, um, the big thing in conference is no F-bombs and no GDs. And I get it. it. It's said all the time. But sometimes when I'm doing it, and I'm not saying I'm right, I may be guilty of not throwing out somebody when I should, I kind of put it into context into what exactly is going on in the bigger picture of the game. Bases loaded, you're trying to blow one out to win it, you hit a pop-up, and on your way back to the dugout, you say, you know, I, I'm not quite as apt to toss you unless you're talking to me. And so that that's where we kind of get into the difference. But again, just like I know we're getting into the strike zone, it's different for every umpire. And, and we can't teach judgment. Um, you either have it or you don't. Um, and you're either going to throw people out or you, or you aren't. And so, you know, just, just to kind of hit on that topic, that's my deal. It happened to me uh, in Chicago with primetime. I called a bang-banger on Ortega at second. Clearly he was out. He jumped up. He said something. I started to walk off. And then he started to make it very personal, very loud, three or four times in a row. So he was done for the entire tournament in Chicago after their first game. So, you know, if, if it hadn't become personal, again, that's a horrible effing call versus you're a horrible effing, effing, effing umpire. That's where I kind of differentiate the two. Yeah, I was saying actually before we were on this call, before you came on, Jay Red, if, I don't even remember this, but you were you were umping our 8 a.m. Saturday game in Chicago, uh, Simon Pierre versus TLC, and you said, listen, I don't want to hear any F-bombs. I don't want to hit it, hear any GDs unless it's F, you're a great umpire. Or GD, yeah. that was a great call, and I just Absolutely. I thought that was I thought that was a great moment where like it kind of took levity in a situation of like kind of into the game, and then guess what? You didn't hear anything, did you? In that game, right. not a thing, yeah. you know. And I get it. The, the whole you know I've been in conference since 2009. The the whole like Joel said, usual suspects deal. I get it. I'm, I'm not saying that it doesn't happen because the human nature element gets involved, and maybe some of the more experienced guys take a little less than some of the less experienced guys. And I, and I just think that just comes with one, knowing you guys. I mean, that you know, when I tell all the guys coming up, hey, they're going to be on you until they see you four or five times, different weekends, in a big tournament. Um, once they get to know you and they understand you, it's a, it's a little different. But when you're coming in, they don't have any clue who you are. You're the new guy. Everything is going to be, you know, criticized over and over and over again. You're just going to have to, you know, deal with it or, or, or move on. So that it's a whole different level uh, at the conference level than it is e even at local trying to umpire. It's not the same. Everybody thinks it's slow pitch, it's underhand, it's three from release, 10 from the ground. It's a completely different animal in the conference. Yeah, no, and I completely agree 100%. And I'm always, always 100% worried going to be with the umpires. That job, in my eyes, sucks, okay? all time like it's one of those things where it's just like you could be good all game long all game long no one notices no one cares do it that's how you supposed to supposed to do your job but yeah. that one iffy man something along those lines oh you're on you're on the shit list forever i think it's hilarious because I, I compare it a lot to road rage you know like i think road rage is one of the dumbest things I've ever seen in my life. Like, I know some really anger management people, and they don't have road rage. In the military, we play softball. We pay out of our own pocket. We fly godly knows how many hours just to see our boys and have some, some horrendous umpires. Yeah. Nobody really gives them shit. And, like, not even, like, like prestigious, like, like well-known umpires. You know... Sure. Those uncle looking umpires that don't even wear the uniform shirt and they're just like strike over inside peg ball yeah. one, like those. And we're like, ah, let them have it. <laughs> like, it's like, I think it's yeah. a, 
And then I go. It's a different animal. It's, it's, the, it's, it's so the same. tense. It's like, oh, yeah. Blue, you gotta be consistent. Yeah. I'm like, hey, David, have you ever been ejected? You know, I, the closest I got, I've yet to knock on wood, so please don't change this. I, it's yet to happen in slow pitch for me. Oh, it's coming. The closest I got was I, uh, I played college hockey uh, as a goalie. Um, and I just got was super frustrated one game, and I hit someone right in the twig and berries, right in front of both refs on purpose. I mean, I just went up, dropped them, and the refs <laughs> looked at me, and they go, are we going to kick you out? I'm like, you can. I don't know. I probably deserve it. Instead, I just got a misconduct, which another person had to serve because uh, I was a goalie. So I was basically, uh, I was basically uh, setting someone else off there. But, yeah, that's the closest I got uh, when it came to that. But, um, you know, staying on this conversation of umping, um, and, and I'm going to kind of say quickly on this one, so we'll kind of go with, with just quick opinions on this, is I want to ask this question, what makes a good umpire in your eyes? And we're going to have very different perspectives here based on where everyone, what they do and what, what, where they're at. Um, DW, I'll start with you on this one. What, what makes a good umpire? Yeah, an, an umpire that gives a good, clear score between innings is, is a good umpire. <laughs> a live Next. Stream. Next. Hey, Jay Red, Jay Red might be the best. I think you get a play-by-play. He's, he's the one that everyone else should should emulate. You get a play-by-play. I love it back there. You a lot going on. I love it. Um, Jay Mag, what makes a good umpire? Confidence. They got to have confidence in their calls. They can't hesitate. They got to come out strong and let their voice be heard and be confident in whatever call they make. Yeah. Okay. I mean, besides consistent. Consistency is the key. That's the that easy but, one, right? That's kind yeah, of the, but the, confidence everyone's... is the one I would go second. I don't think anyone's going to sit here and say, you know what we love is when umpires are not consistent. That's our favorite thing. Do you know what I mean? So that's always, that's always yeah. one of the, uh, the key ones. Joel, what would you say? I would say fear. Fear. Them putting fear Nobody, in, you, nobody you fear in the we all know the three umpires no one messes with. No one gives them any, any nothing, no gripe, no, no, no matter how terrible the call is. Everybody's like, don't mess with that guy. You don't yeah. want to. In fact, there's one right here that I've only had him one time my entire yeah. Converse career, and I'll never forget it. Like, wow. Yeah. It was that fear. It's okay. like, I, I'm not going to say anything. You know what? I'm yeah. going to start speaking Spanish. Do you speak Spanish? No? Okay, right. I'm going to start yeah. talking Spanish. Yeah, you yeah you're, you're in rain. You both do that to me a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And then um, what would you say, Jerry? What makes a good umpire in your I, eyes? I, I think all of those things are super important. One is you got to you got to be at this level. You have to be supremely confident in what you're doing because everyone you're out there on the field with is supremely confident in what they're doing. I'm as competitive about umpiring and getting it right and being the best that's ever done this, just like J Mag and Joel and all these guys that are trying to be at the top level. That. That's what drives me every single game is to, to it, now, do, do I have a chip on my shoulder sometimes? One billion percent. But I have learned that um, preventative umpiring, keeping people in the dugouts, keeping people in the dugouts, keeping people in the dugouts. That goes a long way as you get later in the game. You let two or three creep out one inning, next inning, Two or three on the other side are creeping out. And now you try to get one side in, and guess what they do? Hey, uh, why don't you check on the other side? So you just stop all that, and the way you do it, so I, I mean, I'll stand here for as long as you want me to with my hand up until someone gets in the dugout. Great umpires have their game management is much more important than balls and strikes, fares and fouls, safes and outs. Game management is key, and you got to be confident and that that's where it starts. And you have to be loud. You have to be aggressive. Um, and, and guys just have to see you and get to know you. But but being confident, hustling, being approachable, and being in position. We can't teach judgment. I, if you don't know what three from release is, I'm never going to be able to teach that to you. But I can teach you where to be, how to be, and then, you know, and how to be approachable. When they come to you correctly, always ask for help if they want you to ask for help. If they come to you not so correctly, uh you might get together, you might not. But, yeah, confidence is is number one in, in my book. Yeah, I like uh, – I'll add a couple things. I'll add one that a lot of people say and one maybe people don't a lot. And you actually just mentioned the one that I was going to say that people don't a lot is uh, as, a, as a team owner and also a player and on the field, uh, approachability I think is a big thing. You know, and it doesn't mean that everyone's, you know – having a party or like, you know, your best friends with one team and not the other, anything like that. But just knowing that if you have a question or if you have an issue, you, you feel 
confident that you can go to that umpire. There's just like an arrow. I don't know if approachability is something that can be necessarily taught either. Maybe you have it or you don't, but it certainly could be something that I, I view as a good ump as someone that I feel like I can go ask a question to, or, you know what I mean? Something like that. And, sure. the, and the, and the second one I would say is the old, uh, the old non-factor. Do you know what I mean? We're after the game. That's the last thing we're talking about. No one's talking about the umpire. We're like, who was the umpire? Oh, I think it was the guy with a with a beard. I yeah. think I'm not really sure. Do you know what I mean? And you're like, okay. When you're not talking about it, to me, I'm always like, well, that, that was that was a good thing because I no one envies that job. It's a tough job. We all know it. And if we're we're not discussing that, maybe we're talking about how good or bad we played. I would I'd, way, I'd right. way rather have that uh, right. versus talking about oh that call at second was so bad or something like that. Yeah. You know what I mean? So that that's kind of my thoughts on it. Now. We're going to go to break here in a few minutes, but before break, uh, I want to – actually, you know what? I forgot here. Jay Mag, I forgot you. I don't know how I forgot you down there. You're just so quiet and looking looking so happy down there. I forgot. What makes a good umpire in your eyes? Well, nice. I already answered that one time, but I'll say oh, it again for right. you, Dave. Confidence, confidence, confidence. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It was kind of – you started it. That, or you went from – That's why. I forgot that you are good memory. Nice. And a yeah. good memory is obviously critical, which is why I'd be a terrible umpire. So there we go. Um, so uh, rolling ahead here, I want to just do some questions with you, Jay Red, um, specifically. We'll do a little kind of like, you know, inter-interview here, and then we'll hop to a commercial break here in a quick second. Sure. Uh, but let, let's give you the floor for a few minutes. Um, take us back to the beginning. You know, why did you get into umpiring and how long have you been doing it for? Yes, that's a great, great story. So in 1992... I was a scorekeeper at a church league um, uh, park here in Arkansas. And I came to uh, keep score at a tournament on a Saturday morning on my field. It was on field four. Never forget, it was an 8 o'clock game. And the field umpire didn't show up. This is ASA. And they're like, man, can anybody do this? Anybody want to try? I said, man, let me get out there. I'll try it. So I go out there and I stand at second base. And I look at the second base and I say, is this where I'm supposed to be? And he says, yes. And that second baseman was Ken Hawk, who is one of the greatest umpires to ever do this. So that's where Ken Hawk and I met. So that's where I started, 1992. This is 30 years for me this year. I uh, started in ASA, uh, did that 92 through 94. Uh, then our park switched over to U-Trip. Uh, so that's kind of got my start in U-Triple-S-A. Uh, my first big one uh, was 2000 AAA Worlds in Kansas. That's when they were split up. Me and my buddy went up there. My first, first, first real time with the big boys, nervous as hell. We're driving up there. He's like, dude, it's going to be good. It's going to be great. I'm with you. I'm your partner. We got it. We get up there. They put him in double A worlds. They put me in A worlds. So I would have no idea who I'm working with. Nervous. Saturday night, I have Mountaintop, who had Junior, Rector, Sean Robinson, Ricky Robbins, all those guys against Kevin from Minnesota. And and this was back in the day when there were no dugout rules. So all every guy was on the foul line, on down on one knee, just absolutely hammering me over every strike. And and, th- and this is what this is what got me into it and what I thought, okay, this this kind of relates to them. We had a foul ball down the right field line and I beat I beat the guy to first base to call it fair foul. Called it foul, went against him on my way back. Every one of those guys from Kevin are high-fiving me going back to home plate and saying, man, we really appreciate the hustle. So that locked into my mind right there. If you'll hustle and you'll be approachable, good things are going to happen. You can get away with maybe missing one or two or people not saying things to you that they might say because they say, well, hell, he was up there. At least he cared enough to get out from behind the plate when you're making a call. At least he cared enough to wear the right uniform and tuck it in and no flat bill hats and cock to the side and all that. At least the guy cares about being here, so let's kind of give him a break. So that's kind of where I got my start in 2000 at the level. Um, I took a lot of time off to, to coach my kid through travel ball. Um, and in 2009, um, Andy and Junior came to Arkansas to play in uh, the Tony Jew Benefit Tournament that I throw every year for, for my buddy that passed away. And he said, hey, man, you ever thought about calling a conference? I said, I have no idea what conference is. That doesn't mean anything to me. So Rick Robertson and I got in touch with each other, and – uh, from then, I've, I've been been at it, been at every World Series since '09, except for uh, uh, 20 and 21 when I kind of took a little break. But yeah, it's been good. Very cool. And and real quickly on that quick follow up, by the way, uh, the hustle factor—that's another big one. It just made me think that we play 
We play Wednesday night league. It's not a super serious league, but the umpires are very serious, which is nothing wrong with that. But they have a new umpire that they're training and he hustles and tries. Like I wouldn't believe it. I always tell him, I'm like, listen, you're still learning. I understand that. I get it. You're, I'm sure you're going to mess up some calls, but I got to tell you, I love, I love the effort that you're giving out there. And every single guy on every single team is going to appreciate that. And if they don't, I'm letting you know. Um, one follow-up question here, then we're going to run to a quick break on this is just back on that question for a second is that incredible background you have, but I'm just curious what in the world made you decide, like, what's the appeal of being an umpire? There's certain jobs and hobbies or things where like, man, that makes sense. Why we'd want to do that. And then there's some, you're like, man, this is taking a special animal to do this. And I feel like umpiring falls into certainly into that category. What was the appeal? Obviously you got behind there and you were kind of thrown into the fire. But what was the appeal for you to be an umpire? Um, I think, one, I wasn't a very good player. I, I played a little D-ball, so I wasn't very good, but I always loved being around the game. Um, and so that's part of it. My love for the game of softball really drives me um, umpiring. But also, man, the people I've gotten to meet, especially in the conference, and getting to see these dudes all the time has been really cool. I've built some great friendships, and I know umpires and players aren't supposed to be friends, but it is what it is. We, with, you know, the same group of us follow these guys around for, it's been 10 years for me now, 12, 13, but just getting to meet those people. And also, because I'm so competitive, um, I've found something that I can still compete in, but I'm competing against myself uh, hmm. t- to be the best that has ever done this. And, 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 I, and to do that, you have to be able to do it at the highest level all the time. So that, that's kind of what drives me. I, mean, I just love it. A- absolutely love it. I now, love it. I- there's some Go pieces ahead. I don't love, you know, of course, you know, 2017 smoky final went three hours, 45 minutes. I didn't really enjoy that. 86, 72, one of the greatest games ever, but I didn't enjoy that part, but you know, the rest of it's cool. The rest of it's good. 86, 72 defensive struggle. I get it. Um, yeah, so, yeah. all right, let's, uh, we're going to go to a quick break here. And then we get back. I've got another question for you, Jason. And then also we're going to be talking about some hot button topics. We're going to talk about the strike zone. Yikes. We're going to talk about possibly using a mat. Yikes. We're going to get into some thoughts about the uh, Dudley Pro-M ball. We'll be back right after this. Win the game before you ever step on the field. Shop smashersports.com for all your baseball and softball needs. While bats get hotter and hotter, pitchers are left to fend for themselves. Now, the technology that defends batters and catchers is being used to defend softball pitchers. The Viper Pitcher's Helmet by Shutt is the only Noxie certified pitcher's helmet on the market, making this the safest helmet in the game. Better visibility and protection, comfortable fit, complete head coverage, one year warranty. Get your Viper Pitcher's Helmet only at smashitsports.com. All right, folks, welcome back to the Hit and Sit podcast, episode number four. I'm David Seid McGarlin along with our extremely esteemed panel of Mr. Jason Magnum, Mr. Joel Sanchez, Mr. Dale Weiser, a.k.a. DW, and our special guest, Mr. Jason Oberlag, a.k.a. J. Red. And we're going to pick up the conversation right where we left off with you, Mr. J. Red. Um, one more conversation just specifically on umpiring, and then we'll get into some, some hot-button topics involving uh, some, some of the rules. Um, how do you train new guys at this level. So we're talking conference level. As you said, the pressure is all on you, right? As you said, you put it on yourself. You're competitive with yourself. You want to be the best. I'm sure you want the best around you as well. Um, How do you train guys at this level? Well, a a couple of things. One, uh, it starts with making sure that behind the plate, uh, that they are as consistent as they can be. And a couple of things that, you know, I try to teach when I do, I stand in the same place for right and left-handed batters. It doesn't matter. I I never move out of that slot position. Um, Trying to judge three from release is super important in the conference because we try to tell them if that first one in the first part of the game comes in there and it's borderline on the flat side, 
I'm probably going to call it flat because I don't want to get into a game where the next guy tries to go lower. And by the fifth inning, we're in a modified pitch game. And then in the sixth inning, Travis Clark throws a perfect nine and a half footer that lies right behind the plate. And we don't call it because we've been calling everything else so flat. So um, behind the plate consistency is super, super important. Um, also train them to get out from behind the plate when there's a play being made. There's never a call that you're going to make from behind the plate unless someone's coming home. So get out, support your partner. And if you're a field umpire, you've got to chase those guys from first to second base with nobody on. If they hit one to the gap, you've got to beat them to second base. You can't trail behind them. You can't, you know, walk. You can't. It's just all about hustle and being in the game. And especially when you're in a conference game with no time limit, and uh, extended home runs, it gets long, it gets tiring, and you just got to try, try to stay mentally prepared. But getting guys behind the plate, new guys, as much as we can, that's really our goal because that's where that's where the game is. That, that Not that an umpire decides a game, but, man, you can really dictate a game based on what your strike zone is. And I, don't, mm -hmm. I tell guys, I don't care what your strike zone is. In the book, it says on page 37, it says right there in effect of five is – up to the umpire's judgment. So this is strike zone is all up to you, whatever you want to call it. But if you're calling flat in the first inning, please, in the bottom of the seventh with two outs, you better still be calling it flat. That That's the deal. We don't, you just can't change. And, and I know Jason and Joel can attest to that. Let me know what I need to hit. Let me know what's good so that I'm comfortable throughout the game, but don't change it on me in the seventh. That, that, right. That's the biggest deal. Right, and curious on that too. When you're when you're training umpires, and you know you're teaching them their strike zone and how to develop their own, you know, parameters sure. for it. Is that a lot of on-field work? I mean, is it video? Like, are you doing stuff? Are you sitting there like, okay, you have a pitcher throwing a thousand balls? Like, just no, no, just, no. just, just, just well, curious on that. No, no. What I what we do tell them though is when you're at league at home, get behind the plate as much as you can to see a bunch of pitches. But mm -hmm. I do some videos. There's some stuff out on YouTube that I've done on strike zone videos, and we just kind of try to show them, you know. Three from a lease. So, you know, most guys are releasing it from around the hip. Well, if you put a bat in their hand, that's 34 inches with a ball on top of it. That's about three foot. That's the kind of space you need to be looking for um, as an umpire. And so, you know, Mooch can bring it from damn near the ground level. But, again, it's still got to come up three, and it's got to be able to the, – the biggest thing that umpires need to understand, it's got to come up and it's got to come down before – crossing the front of home plate so it can't come up it can't stay up and then drop that's flat it's got to be coming down at a downward angle before it ever gets to even the front of the plate where we then start judging the strike zone at the plate that's the biggest deal they want they a lot of guys like to call flat and fast because oh it's u-trip it's three from release well three from release is basically six from the ground if for most guys so that's how you kind of kind of think about it. And nobody wants the flat one. The pitchers love to throw it, but they don't want to have to hit it. So, you know, that's the deal. Yeah, I'd say about 2% of players, if that, want that flat one. You know what I mean? Um, but uh, that actually brings up a great topic for everybody here, and it's a dangerous one, the strike zone, right? So I'm going to say quickly on this one, so we're not going to go into, like, you know, 47-minute tirades about the strike zone. I'm sure we all would love to do it. I'm going to ask this question, though. Does the strike zone need to be expanded? Okay, I want you guys to think about that for a quick second. I'm going to start with you, Joel, on this one. Does the strike zone need to be expanded at the conference level? Um, real quick, to piggyback off what Jason said, all that sounded awesome, but I would go slightly simpler. Like, the only reason it goes deeper into the game and we start to hear this thing called, like, oh, don't change it up on me now. Oh, don't change up the th Well, because dudes don't know how to handle some pressure, okay? Whoever says that clearly is feeling it. And it's just like, I need to blame it on something. Like, that's a scapegoat, yeah. all right? We need, like, that right there needs to, like, as soon as you hear that, you no longer exist. Like, you, that's it. You're, you might as well go play with the women or go back to your co-ed. Like, handles, be a man. Like, you know? Um, my little pet peeve on the strike zone, though, the, oh, just one, just one tiny one, because I don't know anything about hitting or the strike zone. So what happens is, first pitch, 
right, will be really close, but your strikes are like, ah, oh, no, it's a ball. It was like over, or it was flat, or it was like, but, but it's close. And you're like, oh, nice. Second pitch, way off, way off. And I'm here like, oh, favorite thing in the world is to get to first base. That's, really? my, that's my whole goal <laughs> is yeah. to like let the guy behind me do his job. And then the last, the, the, the three on one pitch is exactly like the first pitch or slightly off, but it's like a, as soon as he sees it, it's automatic. Strike. I'm really like, just called that a ball. Yep. Like, stay the same. Yep. Like, you just called that a ball. Don't do that to me now. You know? Right. It's the only thing, but once again, with me, there's three things. It's perspective, it's sympathy, and there's logic. Okay, before I go off the rails on people, I'm like, okay, I'm an umpire and I see this. Okay, I'm going to assume he's been consistent with throwing his strike on three and one counts. Let's say I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. And then the sympathetic form would be like, is it close enough to like hit it well enough somewhere? You know, like, is it like situational awareness? And then logic. It's a freaking honeydew coming at you, bro, at five miles an hour. You get the chance to slice open a melon with your hammer. Like, let's go. <laughs> let's yeah. be Conan for five seconds and a half. Yeah. All right. So that's my only slight little lemon take. The strike zone. At <sighs> I have watched so many of your videos, Jason, and so many of the, the like. You're not supposed to be friends with the umpire. I got it. But like, the thing is that like. I'm interested. I'm interested in little rules that I'm here like will benefit my squad in the time where I can use it. So I'm going to poke and prod and be like, hey, I got a question here, you know? So no matter how much I've been educated on the strike zone, that is such a, it is such a phenomenal, you know what blow my mind? Get a tee and go to a home plate on the field and see where you would hit a ball. And you're going to realize 90% of the time, that's not even a strike. Yeah. Like, your wheelhouse, like, if I want to go backside, I'm going to be like, that's where I've been hitting this ball. And if I want to go down this line, I'm going to be like, that's where I've been hitting this ball. Yeah. Like, so the strike zone, I feel like it's fine. I feel like, you know, like, uh, uh, it. once again, logically speaking, the pitcher is throwing it underhand. This isn't baseball where the guy can throw a thousand miles an hour and blow it right by everybody. Sure. Like, you still, Got it. You're still handing it to the guy. Like, here you go. It's one step away from golf, you know? Right. One step away from golf. So so basically to summarize that, Joel, does the strike zone need to be expanded? <laughs> you're saying no. Okay. Got it. Uh, Mr. Jason Magnum, what's your thoughts on does the strike zone need to be expanded? Absolutely not. I think the strike zone, when it's called correctly, is plenty big enough. Uh, you know, the frustration comes in, like, like Oakland said, that you're giving a low and then later on somebody throws a right at a 10 foot, you know, angle and they cause it a strike and they ain't caught it all day. That's just where the umpires got to get a little bit more consistent on the high end of lows and, and get a good floor and then get a good ceiling. But the, the U triple say strike zone, it, it's plenty big enough when it's called correctly. Okay. Okay. DW, what's your thoughts on it? Uh, I'd like to see a half a ball on the, both corners and deep, you know. So you're, you're, for the ex, you're on the expansion plan. Expand it for, by a half a ball in every direction. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Got it. All right. What, what about you, Jay Red? What's your thought on the strike zone? Uh, if, you had, if, if you had to mess with it, would you? Is yeah, it good? Do you like it? It's all, again, it's all subjective. So, you know, I'm, I'm not opposed to a given – half the ball off the plate because we're not calling where it lands anyway. You know, it could land in the other's batter's box and it could still be a strike, a right-handed batter, I mean, right-handed pitcher coming over the left-handed box. But I, I just don't know that it needs to be expanded. I just think that we as umpires need to strive to be more consistent with what's already in the book. I mean, bottom of the shoulder, you know, bottom of the knee, that, that, that's a big, that, that's a lot of room to work with right there as long as my deal is you've got to do what the book says. It's got to be coming down before it crosses the front of the plate. That's where umpires get in trouble. The, a, a plateau pitch that does drop, it drops great, but it dropped after it cut him in half, that's flat. 
You don't want to call it fast because if you say it's fast twice, then he has to be removed from the game. So we stay away from that. We just call it flat. But I, I don't – and a lot of times, besides the 2-0 pitch that they're trying to throw a strike, a lot of pitchers aren't trying to throw strikes. They, they don't want to throw strikes. And so, you know, some people walk a lot and some people have a better eye. You know, I heard the, – I watched the, the podcast on the Resmondo thing with the highest walk percentage and whatever. I don't think that's anything to do with – the umpire that's behind the plate. I could be completely wrong. I don't know who all's been behind the plate for them this year, but um, some guys just see it better and they know exactly that you're not, DW said, you're not giving a half a ball off the plate either way. You're not going to call it deep. You know, so I think it's just, again, if umpires would be more consistent, guys could learn to know what strikes are. But again, it's coming in underhanded. Let's let's take some swings. That's my yeah, deal. I- I like the strike zone personally, myself as well. I would want it expanded, but it's funny that I bet if we sat here with four pitchers sitting oh, sure. here on, on this podcast, they'd be like, you know what? We'll take uh, we'll take higher, lower, left, right. We'll take everything. You know, if Mooch was here almost, or if right. anybody was here, right? But I bet they would all say, we just want you to be consistent. Just let me know yep. what it is. I'll figure it out from out here. That, right. That's the Right, and and I think that's the, that's the key thing that we heard is that when people were not saying, well, I'd rather have except DW who said I'd rather have it, you know, this or that. Um, everyone's saying, well, like as long as it's followed what it should be, because we were talking about more human calls versus what the strike zone actually is. So that's kind of yeah. goes back in, in full because everything's a little bit different. But I do agree also on that is that we play in like a Wednesday night league where or, or a Tuesday night league sometimes where people throw up pretty high. You know, I mean, they don't really care. They just kind of let it. It's not you sure. trip. Uh, they let they let them throw pretty high, and then it's funny you get out to conference and you're like, this is the flattest thing I've ever seen in my life. Do you yeah. know what I mean? It's just interesting, but you have to adjust to what the rules are of whatever you're yeah. playing. So I like the strike zone personally. That's that's my opinion on it. Another comment, strike zone sort of related here, um, is this is <laughs> this is an interesting debate. The good old fashioned mat, the good old fashioned mat. There's always someone pops in on social media, on YouTube, something every year and says, you know what, there should be a mat. Takes the judgment out of it, you know, would be more swinging, right? What do you guys think? Is that is that a terrible idea? Is that a good idea? But more importantly, why yes or no to say a mat, okay? I know it's this is a crazy one. It's like you're saying like a bad word, mat. Um, but let's start, uh, DW, just what's your thoughts on a mat? Yeah, my initial thought is no, but... I've always wanted to try it at one conference event during the year where there's some major teams, some double A, all different classes. Just try it one time just to see what the feedback is, see how it went, evaluate it. But overall, no. Okay, so you're going no. All right. Uh, Mr. Magnum. Uh, No, I'm I'm all against the Met. I think as conference players, we're spoiled. We got the best umpires in the country, you know, so – uh, I trust their judgment. I mean, it ain't always right in my eyes, but, I mean, we're spoiled. I mean, I've been to local local tournaments where I'd probably want a map. You know, honestly, i seen something here in Georgia. I'm not going to call anybody out, but i seen the ball hit the plate in the middle of it on a 3-0, and the umpire knew it, and the dude started walking. He turned back around. He said, no, nah, we don't walk around here. You know, so if I was playing in that, I would probably want a map. But uh, up, in, up where we're at, Honestly, we're spoiled, you know, and 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 we got the best umpires, and I, and I trust their judgment. So I, I'm definitely out on the mat. Okay, out on the mat, Joel. You, DW, you trying to get some umpires beat up in the parking lot later, bro? <laughs> oh my Atlanta, a mat? J- Jason just said it could possibly cross the plate and land in the other batter's box. Now, clearly, he knows a lot more about umpiring than I do, and I just heard that for the first time, and it terrified me. <laughs> a, a mat would only help half-wits like me that are just like, well, I hit the mat, it must be a strike, you know? So it's like it keeps the game extra simple, and the umpire would just have to judge, I guess, height, you know? But... I, but you know, there's nothing pettier in the world than major players. They're gonna lose their minds if it misses by an inch, if it hits the little side of it, if it doesn't cross. they be leave it for league ball, leave that for co-ed, leave that for leave that for all those tournaments that Magnum just said. 
do you want to get people? No, man. That they probably banned the conference after that one event. Like that's it. No more softball ever again. Okay, so that'd be the end of softball. We put the mat in. That's it. It's over. Got it. Uh, Jay Red, what's your what's your thoughts on on the mat? I know you're. I just curious, hearing from an umpire perspective on it. Yeah, I'm I'm with I'm with Magnum and, and Sanchez here. Apps, I I can I'm going to speak for me, not for any other experienced veteran umpires. If we ever went to a mat, I would quit. Okay. Because one, the competitive part of me that that's the drive to have to judge every one of those pitches. 600, 700 in the tournament. That that's what keeps me doing it. I, any, anyone you could put, not anyone, but you could put most anyone back behind the plate at a conference event then, and they could call balls and strikes. That that's not what that's not what the conference is. And my competitive spirit would not let me just stand back there and yeah, hit the mat to strike. But didn't it's a ball. I, I I would not wouldn't do it. Wouldn't go for it. Don't want it. Um, there's a whole lot of other reasons why. Again, if the mat is not right behind the plate, if you didn't, if it got moved, if you didn't move, if you did, blah, blah, blah. no, I, I, terrible idea. Would never do it. Got it. It reminds me of like in baseball where they're doing like the the robo tests, like in your ear, sure. telling you if it's a ball or a strike. Right, it takes the sure. umpire out of it. My quick thoughts on it was slightly different perspective. Is that I'm relatively new to softball compared to everyone else here on the show, and I remember when I first started playing everything I used was a mat, right? Starting playing rec league, things like that. Then I started getting up into tournaments. And I was like, what is this non-mat business? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I was like, this is, of course there should be a mat or something. Then immediately realized, nope, the mat is terrible. Do you know what I mean? And like, like it's funny, I'm on the, I share the same perspective on it. And I think a lot of people, if they went through that progression would kind of see it because my thoughts on it, number one, yes, you, you don't, you're not doing too much back there. Number two, complainers will still find a way to complain Matt or no Matt. Don't worry because I've seen plenty of that where it kind of touches the mat sort of doesn't Matt slash plate complainers yeah. will continue. And the second thing is technically it doesn't even need to pass past the plate to Absolutely. hit the mat. We've got people that we had a guy who's an older guy. He could spin a ball and start it over in a different universe. Do you know what I mean? Basically make a left turn, go through your legs and <laughs> land, land, land uh, not really through legs, but I'm saying land on the edge of the mat, nowhere near the plate. Do you know yep. what I mean? And it's funny, that's a strike, right? Because if it touches it from the right height, it's, a, it's it. So I think yep. we're all in agreement with that. Uh, so we're going matless. It'll be interesting to see this in the comments. You know, if you guys are on YouTube or on Facebook, I'd be, here, I'd be curious. I want to see if we have any pro matters and what they have to say about that. Maybe they can wear a little shirt or something that says pro mat, yep. and we'll see what they have to say about that. But uh, very interesting topic. All right, we have one more topic to discuss today. That's all we have time for on today's show. And that is last week's major tournament, the Chattahoochee major. Um, first of all, sorry, sorry, Jace, I got to go with you on this one. I hate to do it. I don't want to say it was the hit and sit jinx. <laughs> I did it to you. But uh, you did pick the team you were playing against to win the tournament, and they did beat you in the first game. Um, that being said, Jay Red, if you missed that episode, he didn't know they were playing cut four in the first game, but he did pick them. We said he couldn't pick your own team. He picked them and happened to pick the team that they're playing in the first game, who then did beat them. A uh, little rough weekend, but, but J-Mag, you know, tell us, you know, give us a, a quick little rundown of your weekend at the, at the Chattahoochee. Uh, that didn't age well, did it? Nah, I guess I'm that's all right. That's all right. Attention. So usually I just show up and see what time BP is, and I, I go to work from there. I don't ever, like, look at the brackets or get on the message boards. But uh, you know what? It was crazy. Like, we went into the seventh inning, the bottom, zero home runs on a 300-foot field. And I take that a thousand out of a thousand times and hats off to cut four. They, we had maybe two crazy uh, balls. One of them went over Bama's head it, right on it. Uh, we missed the scoop on first. And, and, and this thing you know, we got walked off, man. So my hats off to cut four. Uh, I don't see anything we did wrong that game. We, we did everything we were supposed to. I take up eight with no home runs every day of the week. Um, and on the elimination game with MPT, and again, we were there. We were down by like six with four home runs, and MPT was out. And I was like, this, this game's over with. You know, I felt good. And uh, that's off the MPT. They, they they had some crucial runs, scored how they supposed to score, and we didn't utilize our home runs the way he's supposed to. And uh, we got hit in the chin. You know, every thing about the conference, uh, the, the 300s are the great equalizers. You know, it gives everybody a shot. It's who hits the ball down the best and manages home runs. And uh, 
we didn't we didn't do that the way we were supposed to. And uh, and no matter how good you are, like on Resmondo, we lost a lot of ugly tournaments over the couple of years. Uh, hopefully, this was our tournament where it was our ugly one, and it's back to business, serving our dominance on the rest of the country from this point on. I like it. By the way, I would not want to be playing you guys in your next tournament, just an FYI, which I believe was the Smokies for you guys. Is the next yeah, one? that's it. Yep, yeah, I would ready. not want to. That'd be uh, not the best draw uh, on that's that one. It. Um, Joel, uh, your your Chattahoochee, uh, t- talk a little bit about it, and also you know some of the teams you play. It's always interesting hearing perspective, not only on your team but also teams you played. Any anyone that you know particularly interesting or stood out or anything to to you? So we played. Nightmare, Cup Four, uh, Denver Stars, yeah, a Ball Four, and then Bad Draw. That it. That's why softball is so interesting. How it is because we we managed to squeeze by Nightmare, who Nightmare puts it together pretty well. Okay, like you can't sleep on them either. You can't sleep on anybody. You know, and and. And I'm starting to really despise the amount of people that still judge us by last year's, like last year's season. Like, oh, you guys are super duper awesome. Oh yeah, why do we suck then? Why I don't understand. Tell me why do you think we are good? Like it's kind. This whole episode has triggered all of me. That's it. I'm gonna be raging all day now. So what happens is, we played, uh, we squeezed by nightmare, and that night we go, monster lost. No way. I'm the only person that I know other than than Elvin, the the sponsor. He looked at us and he's like, you know, that's no good, right? And I go, everyone's celebrating. Because like, what, you play a major team or you want to play an A team? Like, like, what do you want? Like, what do you want? Um, hello? No, that's not what I'm about. Like, I wanted to play. I wanted to see what I was about. And I was like, oh, no, it's going to be a terror. And sure enough had maybe the worst game I've ever played in my entire life. We had missed the easiest plays. I found out like three times myself. I was the MVP for cut four that game, definitely. <laughs> and then we played Denver Stars, and we had just seen them come back from the abyss against Sports Reach and beat them, and we're like, oh, well, they're not going to do that. They've only been doing that all tournament. <laughs> Sure enough, we come back and we squeeze one by our rookie, uh, Jordan Robinson, finally waking up from his coma. He freaking walked him off, and we're like, whoo! And then we get uh, ball four, who we've never managed to beat in, like, the history of ever playing ball four. And we just hung our heads, and we're like, well, fellas, you know, it's a good tournament, this and that. There's a point where we're up 17 zip or something like that, and I was just like, What's happening over there? Like, what's wrong with these guys? You know, it's, and then we played bad draw, and bad draw made it seem like we were all of everybody who's ever made fun of their mom growing up. Like, they came at us insanely hard. You know, I know they came at us hard because Everett Williams hits, he hits balls that I think I've seen it break the sound barrier, and some parts of the little ball comes off a little bit, and he sees me in the grass, and he goes, nope. Dink, barely breaking the wrist just to hustle to first base. I'm here like, that's something you don't see every day. Should be an out. I know. You know how I know you want to win this game. That's banana sandwich right there. Out. So, and then, and then we had, we had lost, we had, uh, we had a couple chances to really make it really dramatic. And that we just, it just, it just fell through. However, we did play a whole lot better than we have been playing this whole season. I mean, this whole season has been, oh, just, it, it just, it's like the movie War of the Worlds with Tom Cruise. Like, you look at it and you're like, oh, man, that's so bad. Oh, it gets worse. Oh, there's no way it gets worse. Oh, it gets worse. <laughs> way worse. Like, all the time. So, I like it. That so, was my Chattahoochee experience. But I think oh, in the report. One more thing. Oh, go um, ahead. 300 fields, they don't mean anything. Because who came in first and second? Freaking major teams. Right. Like, I don't know if you saw uh, DW's uh, nice little uh, Bubba Mac. Just <laughs> that that ball was tattooed a little bit. Like, and and that's the thing. Everyone's like, "Oh, that's the hardest hit ball of the tournament." I'd be like, "Have you seen everybody else hit those balls? Like, everyone's been smoking that line lately. 
Like, everyone's just been learning how to be, like, a extra top hand. Whap! Like, it's it's just, like, the, the whole tournament, all the major teams were just letting it loose. So, 300 foot fields, like, that's why they're major, because they know how to hit. They adjusted. No they adjusted. All right, good to know. So, folks, we're going to wrap up here in a second. I'm going to have a kind of a final quick comment. And, and DW, also, if you want to chime in at all, because uh, about the Chattahoochee in our wrap-up here as we kind of go around the room really fast here. Um, I'm going to actually go in, in backwards before I get to you, D, DW, and you, Jay Red. Uh, real quick, uh, Jay Mag, you mentioned this before, though. Your next tournament is – I just want to hear everyone, what's next on everyone's agenda real fast. Uh, Jay Mag, you're up Smokies. Is that next for you? Yes, sir. Okay. Smoky so, Mountain Classic, that's our next uh, one up. So working on those bombs, getting ready for the Smokies. All right. Uh, Joel, what's what's that? Are you are you Smokies as well? Is that next Smokies for you? Smokies as well. Okay, Smokies as well. Um, DW on the way out, and then we'll also, of course, we're going to remind everyone to like and subscribe and all that kind of good stuff. Uh, but DW, um, before we wrap up with our special guest as well, uh, if you had any quick impressions on Chattahoochee and where, where, where will you be next? Right. <clears throat> My flight was late to Atlanta, so I missed all the Friday games, including that big upset cut four over Monster. But I went back and I clipped it for everybody so they can watch it in the highlight video today. I also <laughs> clipped uh, Jordan Robinson's walk off hit over stars in the bottom of the seventh. Uh, I was standing there with my video camera. I didn't know what the score was when he hit it, so I didn't get it videoed. I clipped it. Check out the videos, the condensed games. I was also in the stadium doing the condensed games when Monster played MPT. So I'm curious to J Meg how that game ended. It was a two run game. Did somebody have a chance to win or or how did that end? Yeah, we uh we led the in and off with a solo. We were down three with one home run and led a led off the end with a solo. So that was two zip and uh we had people on base, and we just didn't get it done. Okay. But, I mean, it, it was very winnable. It should have been one. And then, Joel, the loss to smash it was only nine runs, and you only scored 17 with the ball flying at night. Was it Purcell's pitching, or, or what would you say there? Um, first, it was hotter than the Dickens all day. Yeah. So we uh, were extra crispy from the inside out. Mm -hmm. All right, that was number one. Number two, there was there was a certain character that we were rooting for, that he had a chance to really get in there, you know, because like that I got I got cut by bad draw, boom, I feel like I got my little, you know, like uh uh, that's what you get, you know, I I'm cool with it. I like all those dudes, but we had one specific guy that he had a chance to really get it in there and and we just we were toast man we were we were we were fried it was a lot no it was not andy Purcell's pitching he's an excellent pitcher however no it, it was a long day it was a long hot day uh in in atlanta uh, columbus georgia but i'm in kansas city next uh, i am not going to portland this weekend it should still be on UCCA Live. I think there's five conference teams led by Classic Glass, yep. Lund Mortgage, uh, LNS Glass. Some of those teams are the favorite. Uh, so I'll still have a report next week on it. Um, videos coming out. I want to thank Jay Red for uh, coming on. He was the last minute fill in. Uh, we tried. We almost had Travis Clark and and Mooch, but uh, Mooch we got. We did so much back. better. We did so much better by getting Jay Red, right? Ah, there you go. Yeah, I'll be at uh, Kansas City and then the Smoky and then Cincinnati. Very cool. And to wrap up here, Jay Red, thank you so much for for joining us. Uh, it was it was really cool hearing. It, it, in my opinion, for sure. Just also as a host, you're getting to hear kind of the insider information from umpires. It was great. Uh, where where are you at next? Uh, we are at the Smoky next. The return of Ken Hawk. Um, we'll be at the Smoky Mountain Classic. So five yeah. of us are coming from Arkansas. The Arkansas Five will be there, and we're going to have a great, talented group of umpires at the Smoky. So we're, we're looking forward. I'm Smoky, and then I'm Conference Championships. That's that's the only two that I've got on the schedule right now. Awesome. Hey, we'll hey, see you there Jay in Kansas Red, City. Jay Red, as friends, as friends with the guy on the – we won't even name names – the guy on the dish at the major, what was your thoughts on that pitch? Like, we're all – all of us fans are disappointed that Mr. Nelson didn't swing at that pitch at the major last year because he was so hot right there and he could have yeah. really 
gotten Dan Smith into the championship game. But yeah, it's not all love. It's not all love. Oh, uh, no, except for Jamie. Yeah, uh, yeah two there things go. there. One, why is he not swinging? Yeah. That's a huge moment there. And two, um, it looked like a strike to me. You know, because I, yeah. I think about this, 2018, I'm on the dish at the major, records up to bat, one hits the black, and I bang him. Because the black is not part of the plate. If you read the book, the black part of home plate is not part of the plate. Therefore, when it hits the black, it's a strike. But hitting the black without hitting some of the white with a 12-inch ball, and eh, might could happen, 10-footer, could drop on it, hit it, whatever. I, I thought it was a strike, but but you you absolutely 100% have to be swinging. Yeah. But, yep. My opinion. I- I think that's DW's hot topic of the year. It's like a, it's like whoever the special guest is, regardless who it is, has to answer about that question. I wanted to know what the results would have been if he swung, because he was he was five for five in that game. We're still waiting yeah. with that one person. Like, you take that pitch. We're, that, I don't know where we're ever going to find that person, but when, yeah. maybe one day we'll find him. But I, yeah. I get what you're saying with it. Um, so, all right, folks, we got to wrap up. Uh, personally, I will be in Kansas City next. We're playing there. Uh, we'll be at the uh, Crown Town Classic. That's going to be a fun one uh, coming up. Although apparently, according to Jay Red, all the good umps are going west to the Smokies and skipping right over Kansas City. So we'll do our best there. Um, but I want to thank everyone uh, for a- another great episode here of the Hit and Sit uh, podcast. We've had Mr. Jason Magna, Mr. Joel Sanchez, Mr. Dale Weiser, and of course, our special guest, Jason Oberlag, a.k.a. Jay Red. Reminders here, if you're on YouTube, you got the likes, you got the subscribes, you got the shares. If you're on Facebook, Hit those share buttons. Make sure that we're spreading the love here uh, for the podcast. So I appreciate everyone's time. And this was Hit and Sit episode number four. See everyone. Win the game before you ever step on the field. Shop smashersports.com for all your baseball and softball needs. While bats get hotter and hotter, pitchers are left to fend for themselves. Now, the technology that defends batters and catchers is being used to defend softball pitchers. The Viper Pitcher's Helmet by Shutt is the only Noxie certified pitcher's helmet on the market, making this the safest helmet in the game. Better visibility and protection, comfortable fit, complete head coverage, one year warranty. Get your Viper Pitcher's Helmet only at smashitsports.com.